If you would, open up to Acts chapter 4. Don't get too scared. <laughs> Acts chapter 4. I know chapter 5 is in between chapters 4 and 6. I know you're thinking, boy, he's really on it today. <laughs> but if you kind of notice what's here at the end of chapter 4, and I, I'm just going to read through the verses just so that you see the situation at hand. And then the events that take place in chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira, with the apostles being arrested, going before the council, all those things are dealt with. And then you kind of get this overall picture of the saints that are meeting in Jerusalem. So in Acts chapter 4, look down at verse 32. I'm just reading 32 through 35. He says, And the congregation of those who believe were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now, there's your overall picture. Now, right after this comes the story of, of Barnabas, and how he sells and just lays it down at Jesus' feet. Chapter 5 opens up the story of Ananias and Sapphira, who all have lying ulterior motives, and they are both immediately struck down once they are given a chance to repent. So you see, this is kind of the operation and what's going on in the situation in Jerusalem. The other events that take place in Acts 5, which we've covered over the last few weeks, hopefully we still remember those. But whenever you get to chapter 6, in Acts, it opens up, and any time you get a group of people large enough, it doesn't take long before somebody has a, you want to say a complaint, but something starts to become dysfunctional. Now, here they are, the overwhelming uh, mode of operation among the saints is, we take care of, of those who are in need, they're selling properties, they're selling things, the money's laid down at the apostles' feet, and everyone is taken care of. Not a needy person among them is the way it was described in Acts 4. Then you come here to Acts 6 and read verse 1. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. What? is the problem. These Hebrew widows are being overlooked, and realize this is the daily serving of food. Now, no specifically, dealing with widows. Specifically, it says there's a complaint that says arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. I have a hard time deciphering in verse 1 whether it's the Hellenistic widows. Uh, Hellenistic would be people who have, who have learned kind of the, the, the Roman Greek society. Um, they would be the people who probably no longer read Hebrew um, as opposed to the Hebrew people who are like, we're holding on to Hebrew. We're holding on to these things. The Old Testament's written in Hebrew. We're not moving on to this new generation. Um, but once again, these are all saints. So, and like I said, I, I've, tr I've read this verse, I don't know how many times, and I still have a hard time going, is it the Hebrew widows that are being overlooked, or is it the Hellenistic Jewish, um, more progressive in terms of culture, uh, people who are being, widows who are being overlooked? And I'll, and I'll let you decipher that in your own brain. <laughs> We're not going down that road. So, so you just decide it for yourself. Yeah, that'd be the Hellenistic, non -Palestine. In other words, they're not from, from Palestine, yeah. but where are we at? 
We're in Jerusalem. <laughs> so guess what? They are in Palestine. Right. I, it's one of those statements, you just turn it around and you go, does it really matter? Does it change anything? Okay. So, some of the widows are being overlooked among the whole. Now, here's where I want, I want to spend just a moment. Here you were devoted to God, thankful for Christ, People are selling properties, houses, goods, and money is being laid at the apostles' feet. And here you are, a widow, who is not getting the daily serving of food. Would that concern you? I want you to tell me how much would that concern you? Who would you start to wonder, are they looking out for me? You might wonder, do the apostles not care about me? You might even go so far as to say, do the saints here in Jerusalem no longer care about me? What is my future? You, you go, has God forgotten about me? You see how easy it would be to go down that road, don't you? Others, but not me. And so you notice, here it comes, and so you can understand why there is a complaint. Is it a justified complaint? Are all complaints justifiable? No. Thank you. Thank you. No. But this is one that is. So, he says, and notice the reason is because they're widows, and by the way, this is not, if you, if you read through verse 1, where it says the Hellenistic, then you know it says Jews in italics, he says, against the native in italics, Hebrews. This is not a squabble among the widows. Those are both in a, a masculine uh, tense. So this is about their family members, their sons are going, hey, look, you're overlooking my mother. You are overlooking my aunt. You know, Take whatever relationship you think of. This is not widows going to widows. I can't believe they brought you food, but they didn't bring any food to me. That is not the situation. This is the men looking out for the widows, whether they be Hellenistic or, or Hebrew. So they come to this, being overlooked in the daily serving of food, and I don't know how many days you'd like to go without food before it catches your attention. Um, we probably don't think in terms of days. We think in terms of hours or minutes. <laughs> so you see what's going on, and then, I mean, verse 1 is the situation, verse 2. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. The 12 hear about it. And, of course, here they all are in Jerusalem. And notice... Their first response is what? What's their first response? Now look real close at verse 2. Tell me what's their first response. They summon everyone together. What do they want to make sure of? Everybody is hearing the same thing. What is so easy, easily missed? Communication ever a problem? I mean, the very first response here is there's a complaint, and you go, who all's this overlooking? And they go, let's just summon everybody together. And so here's the congregation. He says in the congregation of the disciples. And then this is what they say. So everyone's together. Then comes these words. It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. 
Now, here's the 12. Their response is, if we take this on ourselves, what is going to be sacrificed? Preaching the word of God. And remember, what did Jesus commission them to do? Preach the word. He didn't commission them to say, now make sure you take care of all the food needs of everybody. He says, your assignment, your role, your mission is to take this word of mine, word of Jesus, to every nation. And they did it. And they're looking at this and going, does this need to be addressed? Yes. Are we going to be the ones who do it? No. Does that make them terrible servants? No. What do you see their priority? No. No. Their priority is the spiritual first. Preach the word. Excellent observation, because whatever you think about those stories of it being the 12 of them, and Jesus multiplies the bread and the fish, and they have to make all the trips back and forth to feed 4,000 or 5,000 or whatever number it would be, you go, they quickly realize, this is not what we want to do, because <laughs> this takes a lot of time. And if you notice, this is about the daily serving of food. I mean, that's what it says in verse 1. This is not about, well, one day we go take a meal. This is a responsibility. So their first statement here is, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. And do you see that word serve? It's the same root, where, root word where we get the Greek word for deacon. So, and once again, they're not going to be called deacons here in Acts chapter 6. But what you're seeing is function. They're functioning with one specific task, and yet all to function together to make sure it is done correctly and done with wisdom and done spiritually. Now, he says, the 12 say, we're not going to neglect the Word of God because they realize if we take on other things, what gets neglected? Word of God. Verse 3, they have a plan. It says, Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. Now, if you notice what they put forward, they want seven. Maybe one for each day. That makes sense to me. I'm not sure if that's exactly it, but... It's just my opinion, but it's Juanita's too. Uh, <laughs> but you go through and go, all right, need seven men. And notice the three things in particular that these men have to be. What are they? Good reputation, full of the spirit, and of wisdom. Now, look at those three, three characteristics. The three qualities are in place. How do people see them? How's their reputation? They're highly regarded. In other words, you, you, they're the kind of people that you go, if they're in charge of it, it'll be taken care of, and it'll be taken care of well. The next thing, which is really just, it's really the foundation of the first, full of the Holy Spirit. What are you really saying about their mindset? Think about in terms of, they said they want to do it, they're, they're preachers and teachers of the word, spiritually minded. They don't process problems in terms of what's the fleshly way to do this. They don't process it process it in terms of, 
well, this will get it done, but it might not function the best spiritually. There are men who have a good reputation, and the reason they have a good reputation is because they are full of the Holy Spirit. They think in terms of the spiritual good, putting spiritual things first. And if you take note of this, and because they have the Spirit of God first, what else do they have? Wisdom. They don't just look at this and go, well, you know, yeah, I guess that would work. They're going, no, look, let's lay this out in a way that is wise. And if you want a little bit of an idea here, you can think back to the Old Testament with Solomon. And God gave him wisdom. Now, he, he turned away from God later in life. But whenever he was working off of godly things, people wanted to come in just to see how he handled his servants and the serving of food and, and those kind of things. If you remember, the queen of Sheba came, and she was like, your servants are just blessed just to get to be around you because of how you deal with these things. She even goes on to say, like, you know, I heard about it, but I really didn't believe it. But now that I've seen you, it's so much faster. It's almost, I can't remember the exact, is it 10 times or three times or whatever? She says, greater than anything I ever imagined. And so you see, wisdom comes in, and sure enough, good reputation because they put spiritual things first, and they're full of the Spirit, and to go, and also, they're men of wisdom. So you think they know how to work together? Certainly, in a spiritual way. Now, let's make one little misnomer here. So often, people think in terms of, you know, deacons just take care of the physical stuff. What do you see? They take care of physical things, but they are charged to do it in a spiritual-centered way. Now, he continues on. He says, seven men, he says, we may put in charge of this task, verse 4. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. He says, but it's not going to be any of the twelve. It's not going to be us. And so he puts it before the whole congregation of, of saints. And I want you to realize, notice he doesn't say, and we're going to have three of them be Hellenistic and four of them be Hebrews or vice versa or some mix of that. They don't lay any other uh, constrain, constraints upon it. They say, you choose. Now, he gets to this point and you go, verse 1, we got a problem. Verses 2 through 4, communicate with everyone. Make sure that everybody's on the same page and to see that this still has to be handled in a very spiritual-minded way with wisdom and by men who are, already have a good reputation because they work off of spiritual things with a spiritual mindset. Apostles, it's not going to be us. We can't neglect the Word of God because we're going to keep on, we're going to devote ourselves to prayer, he says, and to the ministry of the Word. Now, if this complaint, if this problem gets mishandled, what will it affect? The whole body. If the apostles jump in to do the serving, what will it affect? Affect the Word of God, affect their teaching, and affect people who might have had an opportunity to learn. Do you see wisdom in this? So often this is not the way we think about our deacons. Once again, I know, it doesn't use the word deacon here, but by the way, if you look at the end of, of verse 2, it says, for us to neglect the word of God and in order to serve tables, guess what about that word, serve? The root word of that one is also where we get our Greek word for deacon. Deacons are about service, about serving spiritually even among physical things. Now, verse 5. How are they going to react? Here we go. You lay out, you got a problem, you lay out the solution, 
And then you go, and where do people stand on this? Well, this is what happens. Verse 5. The statement found approval with the whole congregation. Wow. Take, sit back and enjoy that thought. Everybody's on the same page. You don't have somebody going, hey, well, I want to be in charge of that. Put me in charge. I know all these widows. What if you were somebody who wanted to, but you weren't selected? Are you going to be... Are you going to show yourself to not be spiritually minded? Because remember, who they're looking for? Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, wise. When somebody starts throwing up a stink because they don't get to lead, guess what it proves? They're not very wise. They're definitely not spiritually minded. So sometimes those things happen. But if you notice at this point in time, how does the whole congregation see this? This is great. Then, he says, and then it's going to list off these names. And they chose Stephen, and it gives you an added detail here. He says, Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's going to give you a lot of details about Stephen in, in chapter 6. So you already know just from, just from this statement and what you know from verse 3, Stephen is a man of good reputation. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He's a wise. And he's also full of faith. I don't know about you, but Stephen sure sounds like a kind of guy I wouldn't mind being around a whole lot with. Now, he gives you extra detail about Stephen because what's going to happen to Stephen at the end of the next chapter? He's going to be stoned to death because of working off of spiritual things and being wise. You can be wise and still die. Then the next person that's brought up is Philip. And if you think forward through the book of Acts, you're going to see Philip have a great interaction with who? The Ethiopian eunuch. So are you really seeing that these guys are spiritually minded? Like the way they're going about things is not like, well, we just take care of the physical stuff. I mean, they're still teaching. Stephen's going to have a great teaching. Philip's going to be a teacher. But they're also going to take care of this daily serving of food. He continues, the rest of these, the other five, really don't know anything about other than their names are written right here. He says, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Armenaeus, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. He's really the only one that you get a, a solid take on. Do um, you know what a proselyte is? Now, get, get a load of this. He's had quite an experience. Being a proselyte, he was born a Gentile, converted to Judaism, then who did he learn about? Jesus, and now he's, he's in Christ. So he's had quite, a, quite a, a journey to get from being a Gentile to Christ. And, and by the way, sometimes people talk about, and it's not wrongfully so, but they talk about Cornelius being the first Gentile convert. As a proselyte, he was a Gentile once upon a time, but Cornelius is the one who's fully Gentile when he comes. So maybe that's just a little fly in the ointment, but anyway. So you see what's at hand. Here are these seven men, and, and if you kind of take note of what they're going to do, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask you a little probing question here. For these widows, who are being taken care of. What kind of relationship do you think they have with these seven men? Well, no, I mean, they're coming around bringing food every day. What, how do you feel about people who bring you food? What's that? Yay! Yay. <laughs> Grateful? Comfort. Comfort? Do you go, oh, they don't like me? Hope not. 
you get a, you kind of get a stronger bond, don't you? You get a stronger relationship, Deborah. Right. And you think Deborah brings up, it would make them feel worthy. And you go, here's a group of widows that are being overlooked. And now they actually get what instead? Special treatment. Isn't it amazing how God does that? Somebody who thinks they're left out, left behind, and then in the end, after things work together in a spiritual way, they actually get an extra blessing of getting those more time together. And so you look at what's at, what's at hand, and then, of course, verse 6. It says, and these, or these seven, uh, they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And you go, the congregation brings these seven. It says, these are, these are the seven. These are men of good reputation, full of the Spirit, wisdom. It says, and the congregation brings these seven to the apostles, and what's the apostles' first response? Pray for them. Is it always easy? Is service always easy? Do it. How often do we pray for those that serve? Not enough. I, this is not some, you know, big feel bad about this. But there are times... Man, do you ever just pray for those that serve? All the time. I'm not talking about military service. All right. But specifically here, talking about within the congregation, praying for those that serve, that do take care of physical things, especially in a spiritual way. And so you notice... Here the apostles, here they're going to begin. He says, they brought them before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And they think about, you know, they're just saying, look, you, you go with our blessing, is the idea. Maybe a little instruction to go with it. That's kind of that laying on a hands thing. Um, you can read back in the Old Testament, whenever Moses is about to die, it says that Moses laid his hands on Joshua. Joshua's going to be the next leader. And to go, there's some instruction that's given. And there's a blessing that's given. I'm going, all right, go serve. Keep that good reputation. Be spiritually minded. Be wise. And here's Stephen. Now, because they took care of physical complaints in a spiritual way, look at what it paves the way to do. Look at verse 7. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. Now, this situation, remember, the vast majority of the saints are still in Jerusalem. There were some that heard it on the day of Pentecost, and they went back to their own country or own nation. So there's kind of a grassroots movement there to provide for what's coming later in Acts. But here they are, and what's going on in Jerusalem is... The word of God just keeps on spreading. And it's affecting more and more of those people that are in Jerusalem. He says, the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. He says, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Notice who else is being affected? The priests. Really? If there was anybody who would really be able to see if they had a heart for it, the greatness of Jesus, it should be priests who knew the old covenant. Because everything under that old covenant pointed to Jesus. Every sacrifice, everything about righteous living, everything about how to, to, to walk and teach among God's people, everything says, you know what? Jesus did it best. It would be the easiest report card to ever fill out. Who's the best of all time at service? Jesus. Who's the best teacher of all time? Jesus. Who's the best one to ever keep the law? Jesus. That's easy stuff. Not how you do it, but it's easy to see it. So here they are, and all these priests are coming. And they're coming to Jesus. Now, here you go. It doesn't say all the priests. It just says many. 
verse 8. You get two more details about Stephen. You're filling out Stephen's resume. He, he, he kind of comes across in a, a very, very unique way. Verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Now, I don't necessarily know that the two stories are connected. Don't, don't take this like, oh, well, Stephen's just going out and saying, well, we got five, five loaves of bread and two fishes. Let's just multiply this, and all of a sudden, all the widows will be fed. I don't know that that's the connection at all. But realize, there are miraculous things that are going on with Stephen. And if you think about him, from verse 3, man of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, Full of and end of wisdom. Then you get down here into verse 5, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, full of grace and power. Now, let me kind of throw this to you. When it uses the description that Stephen is full of grace, what do you take from that? What do you hear? You know, if if someone was to describe a person that you didn't know, and they said they're full of grace, what would you think about them? Godly man? Kind? Forgiving? Someone you could always trust? Compassionate? Isn't it interesting? These... These terms and describers that are used, like if you ever, if somebody was ever described as being, they're full of the Spirit of God, have a good reputation, wisdom, full of power, full of faith, you would go, who is that? I'd want to know them. Now, he says, and he's performing these great wonders and signs among the people. Look at verse 9. First word of verse 9. But. So, this is who Stephen is. Does that mean his life is easy? No. And notice, Stephen is going around and taking his, his aspect of serving the, the widows that were being overlooked, just like, just like Philip, just like Timon, just like Parmenas, just like every other, every other one. So whenever you see what he's doing, realize he's doing this in addition to the daily serving. And whether there were seven of them because there's seven days a week and each one of them took care of it one day or whether they all seven worked on it every day and just had a smaller amount, doesn't say, but you just kind of see they're all part of it. You get to verse 9. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. Now they're arguing with a man who's full of grace, full of wisdom, full of power, full of the Spirit. How do you think that's going to go? They're not going to win. Now, let's just kind of deal with a little bit here. The people come from what's called the synagogue of freedmen. And it's going to give you four different geographical locations. The first one, he says, Cyrenians. You probably already know a Cyrenian already. Simon of Cyrene. That's what a Cyrenian is. There's somebody from Cyrene. Cyrene is in northern Africa. Present day, it'd be in a, a place called Libya. Um, northern, I mean, northern coastline of Africa. It would be west, well west of, of, uh, of Egypt. Alexandria is actually in Egypt. So when it says Alexandrians, um, later in the book of Acts, you're going to see ships that are Alexandrian ships. Alexander's on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea there in Egypt. And Alexandria is a major hub for Jewish people. Um, if you've done your uh, research on libraries, in, in this point in time, the library that was in Alexandria 
was the greatest library on the planet. And so if what they would do is if you had a unique scroll or a book, you would bring it to them, they would write a copy, you would donate your original, and you would get the copy to take home. And by the way, that would take a long time to make. And so they acquired all these things. And there were a lot of Jews that were down there. And if you've ever heard of the, the Septuagint, the Old Testament originally written in Hebrew, but as all these Jews started to lose their Hebrew roots and become Hellenized, they couldn't read Hebrew anymore. But they wanted a copy of the Old Testament that they could read. So they needed somebody to translate the Old Hebrew into the common language of the day, Koine Greek. Koine means common. Common language, so that then all the Jews could still read, that could read, could read these things of old. We just imagine, by the way, whenever Jesus is young, you remember whenever Herod's seeking for his life, where God tells Joseph to take Mary and Jesus? Go down to Egypt. I've often wondered, did they go to Alexandria, where as a young boy, he could read scripture? Because by the time he gets to 12, he sure knows a lot of scripture. I don't know that as a fact, but being down in Egypt, sure a whole lot closer to Alexandria than being in Palestine. But, says, here's the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, think about Liberia along the coast, Alexandrians from Egypt. He says, some from Cilicia. If you go back and, and think about where Paul is from, Paul of Tarsus, that's in the region of Cilicia, kind of on the northern side of the, of the Mediterranean Sea, but, but not as far west as Greece and, and, Rome, and Italy. Then he brings up in Asia, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, he says, these people are from all over. I mean, nothing about fighting four regions at once. Yet is Stephen outmatched? No, because who's at work within him? Spirit of God. And grace is on him. He's full of grace, full of power. He says, they rose up and argued with Stephen. You go, oh boy, this doesn't sound fun at all. Verse 10. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. They couldn't cope with it. <laughs> just think about the phrase, just in general in English. If some situation happens and somebody says, man, they can't cope with it, what does that mean? <laughs> they didn't have a response. They ain't over their head, right? No. These, when it says the synagogue of the freedmen, synagogue is just where the Jews would meet for worship and for other things. So he talks about basically Jews from, from Cyrene, Jews from Alexandria, Jews from Cilicia, and Jews from Asia. And so they've kind of banded together to go, we don't want any more of this teaching of Stephen and these others. And so they have a larger group. Um, it's kind of like an association says the synagogue of the freedmen. Don't think that, you know, they're on four different countries. But go, now they're here, now they're in Jerusalem, and here's what they represent from back home, and now here they are. So, right. It's, it's, it, to give a, another illustration, have you ever heard of Thailand? Well, the actual translation in the Thai language of Thailand is free land. Yet, if you know anything about Thailand, it is not free. So, it's a good point you bring up that it, freed men is just a title. It's not like they've been freed from sin or they have freedom back home or something like that. It's just a title. Not believers. And so, that's why they... They can't cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen's speaking. Verse 11. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So, if you can't do it the honest way, they secretly induce men to basically be false witnesses. And he's going to use that term here in a moment. But 
They, they get them to come up. And I want you to notice the, the words that are used here. He says, these, these men that are making these statements. And he says, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Blasphemous words against God. You want to know what the, the law says about people who blaspheme God? Put to death. Oh, let's go back and read it, though. Look back at Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24, verse 10. There's a situation, we'll read it, in verses 10 through, through 12 about someone who blasphemes the name of God. And then they're going to ask a question to God, well, what do we do with someone who blasphemes the name of God? And this would also include, if you ever wanted any extra fear on why not to use God's name in vain, here you go. Leviticus 24, look at verse 10. Verse Lays it out, and they're already in the wilderness when this is written, so you get an idea. It says, Now the son of an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the sons of Israel, and the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel struggled with each other in the camp. The son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name. The name. Who are we talking about? God. And cursed. Don't just think in terms of curse words, but think of calling curses upon somebody as well. It says, so they brought him to Moses. Now his mother's name was Shelemith, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. It says, he blasphemed, so they bring him to Moses. Moses will know what to do. He's the judge. Verse 12, they put him in custody so that the command of the Lord might be made clear to them. So he's taken into custody, and now who are they going to appeal to? What does the Lord say we should do with such a person who blasphemes the name? Verse 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the one who is cursed outside the camp, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head. Then let all the congregation stone him. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If anyone curses his God, then he will bear his sin. So what does the Lord say should happen? He says, Those who heard... He says, those who heard him blaspheme, they're the witnesses. He says, they're to lay their hands on his head. Now he will bear the weight of his sin. And since they're witnesses, what's their role in this stoning? They throw the first stones. And then after they cast the first ones, who else joins in? The whole congregation. So who is this judgment on behalf of? It's on behalf of God and is carried out by every man. Now, he gets to this point, and then God gives this detail in verse 15. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If anyone curses his God, then he will bear his sin. Is this just a one time, or is this a rule for the future? Now and into the future. Verse 16. He says, Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the alien as well as the native. Because remember, was this man completely and totally Hebrew? Remember, his dad was a Egyptian. He would be considered a Samaritan in one sense, later on down the line in history, but not at this point. He says, the alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. How serious did God take using his name? What should that have brought about within the people? A great honor, fear, and respect. Now, I want you to actually now look over at the book of Deuteronomy, because I want you to see a little bit about witnesses. Deuteronomy chapter 19, look at verse 15. Deuteronomy 19. Look at verse 15.
A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of an iniquity, guilt, or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be confirmed. So if there was just one witness, what happened? Nothing. It's as if it never happened. But if there are two or three, what happens to the matter? It's confirmed. By the way, this is also quoted over in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. My memory is serving me correct right now. So, is that just an Old Testament principle? Well, that sure takes care of a lot of problems if you actually confirm whenever people speak. Is that really what happened? Well, is there somebody else who can confirm it? Or is this just one person's opinion? Verse 16. If a malicious witness, one who wants to attack, you know what malice is? Attacking others? If a malicious witness rises up among a man against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, like let's just say blasphemy, verse 17, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly, and if the witness is a false witness, and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he is intended to do to his brother. Oh, so if something was of a lesser value, like, you know, this would be like the cutting off of a hand, then if you're a false witness in this deal, what do you have to give for your false witness? You'll have to give your hand. Well, blasphemy, the penalty is death. If you're a false witness there, what is your payment? Your life. Boy, doesn't this sound like wisdom? Whenever people show up in court to bear witness, they're willing to put their self on the line for what they're saying? You think that would clear up a lot of false witness problems? So oh, much wisdom back here. Oh, if we could just learn those things. Then, he continues in verse 19. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. The rest will hear and be afraid. Did you hear this, Stephen? I mean, wrong name. Did you hear? I always try to use names that I know nobody of at this congregation <laughs> so that nobody thinks wrong. Uh, let's just kind of, kind of imagine. Um, let's think about Saul. I don't think we have a Saul among us. Um, just, just imagine if you saw Saul and he's missing his right hand and you're going, man, what happened to you? Well, I was a false witness in this trial and it got found out. Oh, think that have your attention? Certainly. If it didn't, we'd be fools. But, he says, the rest will hear and be afraid and will never again do such an evil thing among you. In other words, it's only going to have to happen once and you'll learn. He says, thus you shall not show pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. He says, there is no pity in this. This, if you stop and think about it, this is an area where there is no grace. Like, if this is what you do as a false witness, you know it going in, and there will not be any grace shown to you. What do you see about God and justice? Things will be just. Now, come back over to Acts chapter 6. So, here are these Jews of the synagogue of the freedmen, outsiders, not in Christ. Yet, here's Stephen, who's a Jew, because they're going to drag him for the Sanhedrin. You only get in there if you're a, if you're a Jew. He says, they, we have heard him, Stephen, speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Well, if that was true, then Stephen should be stoned to death. And who would throw the first stones? The witnesses, the witnesses. Verse, well, let me go ahead and show you this. Look over chapter 7. You already know that Stephen's going to be stoned to death. But I want you to notice verse 58. When they, the council, had driven him, Stephen, out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young, young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen. So you kind of notice what's going on here. Do they follow that same practice? 
They did it very corruptly, but they did it. Now, come back over to, to Acts chapter 6. But then when you get down to verse 12, he says, And they stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. So, they can't cope with what Stephen's telling them about Jesus. They secretly introduce men to falsely accuse Stephen of blaspheming not only the Moses, but also God. And so within that, they stir up the crowd of saying, hey, we got a blasphemer of God. Everybody goes, let's get him. And yet at the same time, it's ironic to me, whenever it was Jesus that was going to be crucified, they said, well, we can't, we can't kill him ourselves because we don't have that right. We have to go to the Romans. Now, what happened to that with Stephen? You see the inconsistency? Yeah, you can always see inconsistency in evil. It's not consistent. But the verse 12 says, They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him, Stephen, and dragged him away and brought him before the council. But now it turns into just a deal with the synagogue of the freedmen, and now who's Stephen going to stand in front of? The whole Sanhedrin, the highest court among the Jews. And they're going to drag him there, which tells you he, he's not going, oh, that's a good idea. He's being dragged there. And if you notice, he's a man of grace. He's not putting up a big fight, not drawing a sword. He's a man of power. He's about to show his wisdom by the Spirit of God in what he's going to lay out before them. And so I'm going to get you right here to this edge, and then uh, I'll be gone next week. I'll be preaching and teaching out in Delaware. I'll be flying out on Friday. You be prayerful for the people there, uh, prayerful for me, then uh, I would certainly appreciate that. And next week, Brent will come in, and he'll start right here uh, in, in verse, verse 13 with, now it's time to go before the Sanhedrin. And so you leave that and you go, here's Stephen. And keep in mind, when Stephen is stoned, that means there's no longer seven who are serving tables. Now there are six. There's also about to be a persecution that begins in Jerusalem, and everybody's going to leave except for the apostles. Isn't it interesting that God showed the saints how to deal with difficulties on a physical level right before they get scattered all over the place. It's like God knows exactly what's going to happen. We need to remember that too, because he does. Juanita. Lord will take care of it one way or the other. <laughs> That's for sure. All right, have a good rest of the week.